So, uh, for this present, I'm, I think well, you all do know me, but I'm Will Peterson, for the record, I'm a senior here in the computer science department. Um, and I'm going to talk about newer tools and software in web development. Um, not, they're not quite brand new. One of them has been around for a few years, but they're gaining popularity, so I think I can talk about them. Um, you might have heard of some or all of these, or maybe even use a couple, but I'm hoping that none of you have, um, or at least that you'll all get something from it, uh, and you'll all learn about some new tools. I'm gonna call, cover them all kind of very briefly. The goal is just so that uh, in any web development project, you kind of like have an idea of what tools are available. Um, and hopefully this will be beneficial. So first, I'm, I'm going to be covering some frameworks. Um, Ruby on Rails, Django, Backbone.js, and Node.js. Node.js, so that, that's not really a framework, um, but there are frameworks attached to it. I'll go into what that it actually is uh, a little later. Um, I'm going to also talk about threads compiled languages. Uh, CoffeeScript, SAS, and Hamel. Again, yeah. One. So, what is a web framework? Um, it's a way of organizing the data on the server. Uh, it's my best way of, kind of putting it. It's usually given with one language, and then, but you need to sort where you're going to put all your images and your um, style sheets and JavaScript and um, and even just the HTML. You need to sort of where, what's going where and how um, the server knows to direct what uh, pieces back to the user. And so a web framework is a way that is a way of organizing all that data. Um, usually uh, there's, like, there's hundreds of them, probably dozens per language. Um, some languages that I use are Ruby, Python, PHP, um, goes on for a while. Uh, next is MVC. I uh, just want to cover that because it's kind of come up a lot in the rest of the presentation. That stands for Model View and Controller. The model is just like an object in a database that represents, could be like a user would have, a user model would have a name, password, email, um, maybe a blog with the profile picture in it, etc. Um, so it's, so MVC is a way of sorting all that. So M for model. V is view itself, which is going to have usually like a template layout. Um, it's what user, it's where, like the HTML, for example, is part of the view. And then controller is uh, usually requests will get routed to a specific controller, and then the controller routes that to the correct views. Kind of does some um, logic beforehand, figures out uh, relevant user data that the view will need, etc. First Ruby on Rails. Uh, it's written in Ruby. Um, Ruby, if you're not familiar with, is a very nice clean language. It's kind of similar to Python, which I know I'm pretty sure all of you know. Uh, I like it. It's cleaner. It's pretty. There's a way of putting it, um, and there's some convenient functionality in it. Uh, a benefit of this is that the Ruby has a lot of gems, which are like a, a library system, system of modules that. Uh, Ruby uses, and they're very convenient um, for Rails, because I just like dropped in a Facebook gem into the framework, and it just kind of uh, added in so much more functionality. It's something I can connect to Facebook and get users' um, education, history, and whatever, um, just kind of adds in an API. So gems are nice. It's MV, it uses MVC, like I talked about. Um, and then convention over configuration is the big thing about Rails. Um, that means there's like a certain way of doing things, and so it wants to, you spend your time not figuring the little details, and just start out with that standard convention, saving you time. Um, and then don't repeat yourself, so you shouldn't have to repeat the same 15 lines of code a dozen times throughout the application. Um, you should just be able to have it one place and then call it um, several times. And then community is a great benefit of Ruby on Rails. Um, they're kind of, Fanatics community, and so there has been a lot of work done on it. Um, you can find pretty much any question is answered. It's one of the most com uh, biggest categories on Stack Overflow for questions. 
And so that's a really huge benefit when I was working it. I've done, um, so I know Rush, I should mention before, I've done projects in all of these using sometimes multiple at a time. So, yeah. Django is Python, uh, Python based web framework. It's very similar to Rails. Um, also, file field controller and DRY. Uh, it's not as automatic, but what I mean is in Rails, I found that, well, Django does it a bit too, but one of the nice parts of these frameworks is, for example, I say in my model, all right, there's a user model, and it has many, um, like, pictures or something. And then it creates um, a one to many uh, sort of structure in the database. It creates, starts creating all those tables and rows on its own for you and naming them with its own convention. So you just kind of like tell it this, and most of the time it takes care of it itself. Sometimes you have to dig deep, you gotta get your hands dirty and clean it up. Um, but so Django does that as well as Rails, but it doesn't quite do it as automatically. Um, so you end up doing, I like it, because you get your hands dirty and you kind of really, really do a little more coding in it. Um, so, and I know a lot of you guys have these Python, so uh, if you want to try out a um, web framework, Django is that with a model view controller kind of set up. I recommend Django because it is just gives you an idea of what it's like in a familiar language. And then uh, next is backbone.js. And so this is entirely different, very, very different from oh, okay, uh, than the from the other two, in that it's not a back end, it's not running on the server, it's running on the client's browser. because um, as time in the course of kind of history for web development a lot has been now on the browser with JavaScript and Ajax doing a lot of the work, um, where instead of requesting a new page, for example, with Facebook, like you'll see a hash and then a little bit that follows the hash. That's not requesting a new page, but it is keeping track of like where it is, and it's what it's doing is it's where it is in the JavaScript kind of framework. And so you end up having models, views, controllers, all in um, the JavaScript on the user's browser rather than back on the server. And that's that you do some um, kind of fun things with like one page web applications. Uh, so it's all client side. And so it, has, it also has models, collections, views, rendered. I want to see. I can show that at the end if you have time. And then so, oh, models, collections are like, so the big things in what and background are models, collections, views, and routers. Models are kind of as it is defined before, objects, properties that you can find. Collections are a collection of models. It's like if you have a song, then you have a music library. The music library is a collection of songs. Next is views, which are, you basically take your HTML that you would have shown as a view in a regular, um, another framework, and you turn it into a little bit of JavaScript that when you call that view, and you say, all right, I want to plug in that view into this div tag, into this kind of frame I set up, it then expands it in right in. So like if all your kind of views are stored in JavaScript on the users, like on the user side of the browser. And that um, makes, it might make the first initial load a little longer, but it makes a lot of the updates a lot, very fast, much, much faster. So you don't need to re, you don't have to use frames, but you still don't have to re, uh, well, uh, re send a new request and server every time you just want to click back and forth. And then routers are kind of like um, controllers. They route the path. So like they read the hash at the end of the URL and route that to the correct view. Yeah. Node.js is, as I said, it's different. It's not actually a web framework, but I couldn't, do want to put it in its own little group by itself. and make it all lonely. Um, it's JavaScript, but it's running server side. Um, or that's one way of putting it. It's, it's really, that's a way of running JavaScript as an actual language not just a client kind of use that thing for a browser. You write JavaScript and then uses Google's, um, the Chrome V8 engine to turn that right into machine code and it runs very fast. And because it was, I mean, with, despite all the flaws in JavaScript, it's simple, it's clean, it's kind of pretty cool. Um, it's so, but beyond the, just the framework, it's also used in places like Apache, because you'll just say create server, um, listen on port 80, and you have a set of instructions for what it does to make it this request. And there's a lot of other frameworks that have been made 
um, that use Node.js, who's kind of the express school. And one of the benefits is it's the same language on both the server and the browser, which makes development kind of nice. And it's a surprisingly large library um, because um, all of the work that has already been done on JavaScript, it's now as accessible as, like, not as really a practical programming tool. And I think I was going to show you this thing. Example of a web server. This is taken right from their main page. You just go, go be, query HTTP, then create server to find the function with the request and response, and then write it right in there. Um, Express uh, JS. There we go. Uh, I might not be able to load. Oh well. But um, Express takes care of it even further where you just say get um, and you just say you know, like define with asterisks what kind of requests to accept and where to send them. There we go. There. Where? even simpler with gets and pushes and puts and um, posts. It's really nice. I recommend, I really recommend trying that, just fiddling around if you ever use JavaScript for writing projects anyways. Might as well just install Node.js and give it a try and see what it's like. Okay, next is transcompilation. So what this is, it's one source language compiling to another source language. I'm just using language here, though I'll be covering things that aren't quite languages. For example, I'm going to call HTML really well. It's kind of a language, but, um, but so the idea is that you have one language which has a nice, clean um, syntax, clearer uh, added functionality, and then you say, you write it, it for example, well, we're going to go with cover as CoffeeScript, you write it in CoffeeScript, and then it turns it into JavaScript. And it usually does it very efficiently. So you, you, you write less code, and then the code you get at the end is generally better, faster than um, you would write 90% of the time. So CoffeeScript, for example, compiles to JavaScript. It has a much cleaner syntax um, and a very efficient compilation. I think it's, they did that like a survey, and it was like 90 or 95% of the time. Um, it would be as fast or faster than that person wrote it. Um, and then it adds functionality. And a similar thing is closure script, um, which is it's still in the infancy phase, phase, but I really like it. It's kind of clever. Closure is a uh, it's a functional language, is functional language like Lisp that runs on the Java virtual machine. And so someone had the idea to make closure script, which is like kind of a cross between scripting and a functional languages language, which turns into JavaScript. Um, I think I've got an example of copy script over here. So on the left is CoffeeScript, on the right is JavaScript. You can see, so this is what, so when it's compiled, it kind of automatically puts something up there. Once you do nice things, if statements, defining functions in line much clearer, more clearly. Um, I think this kind of gets at it, is that the simple inline bit. Um, or you see the race equals winner runners. That's defining a function. Race is a function there, uh, where it prints winner and then runners. But it, see the ellipsis. That lets it take in additional arguments, and so like it adds in this of code to make sure it's doing properly, and adds functionality and adds in checks if it needs to. So yeah, I can cover that later. Okay. Then there's SAS. Um, oh, so CoffeeScript also is like a default thing on Ruby on Rails. You don't have to use it, but it's automatically set up to use any CoffeeScript you write, turn it into JavaScript, and then serve that up. Um, SAS also is the same way, where it's, on, it's already on Rails. Um, Combust the CSS style sheet sheets, it's cleaner. Uh, what I like is that all CSS is a valid SAS. That was a big... Um, reason I started using it because I was reluctant to try CoffeeScript because I'd already written so much JavaScript that I made, didn't want to get bogged down. But then if all my style sheets were already valid sets, I just could copy it over and then start writing, cleaning it up and writing in sets later. 
and adds variables, functions, nesting, and mixins. Uh, so variables is like you define blue at the top, just like dollar sign blue equals and then a particular shade of blue as a hex code. And then later in your code, when you're trying to make the color or background color of uh, a div tag or text, you just put it in blue. And then when you ch want to change the color a little bit, you want to like tweak how it looks, you just change the variable and throughout the rest of your style sheets it changes, which is wonderful to develop. Um, and then there's also include and extend, so you can include other scripts and extend them. Uh, well, functions are functions like darken 10%. So you have a, your default, your color that you're using, and you say darken it 10%, and it calculates, it, would, it does, figures out what color that would be, and puts that in into the uh, compiler CSS. Nesting means um, you can, well, you'll see it. I'm going to show you. This is one of my favorite things. It really is. Um, <coughs> So, favorite might be, I think an example right here, um, where in, it's, the, it's dividing a mason, which is something that basically so you can call it later in other styles and reuse it, but it also has nesting in there. So, table header, fine, so that when it goes data down here, it's getting cut off, it includes this, I believe, it goes data, then table, data table header, and it lets you uh, sort of sorts them out later, just grouping it, and it really reduces the lines dramatically. It reduced like uh, 300 lines of style sheets that are written to about 40, um, just because I've been repeating things like unnecessarily and, nest, and couldn't nest. It's really fantastic. Uh, a similar thing is stylus. Um, which is used for JavaScript stuff, uh, uh, um, like Backbone or Node. I was, if I was in working with either of those environments, I would try Stylus. It's very similar. Um, just kind of uses JavaScript a little better and is kind of more friendly towards it. And then Haml, things are uh, the last list we're going to talk about, which compiles to HTML or ERB. Um, it can be used with Rails very nicely, but I don't think it comes with it in Rails 3, where we're at. Uh, it's cleaner again. It's going to be, it's going to, like the others, find it very similar. Let's see. So, if I wrote, I think that's the best example, but dot content, it automatically, it, say, it automatically considers that a div and adds in class as content because it sees the dot. Um, I can find you a better example out here. So here's the camel, and here's what it turns into. So it defines it like just just content, and it says, "Oh, it's an ID. It's gonna be it's gonna be the, the ID of the div tags content." And then next, it's gonna automatically consider each thing that doesn't have a tag name next to it is gonna be considered div, because that's usually what you use it. And so it says, "Oh, it's gonna have classes left and column." And you can see up there that. that um, and again, yeah, just in line, so much easier and cleaner, and just easier to read too. It it goes beyond just saving time and uh, shorter code, but it's much easier to read and understand. Um, personally, I I haven't used much with Hamel. I've used there's a similar thing called Jade, which is the same thing, but it's made for uh, kind of backbone like or JavaScript type fading. Looks pretty much the same, except you can start running code in line with it. Right. And then, so an example of what I'm doing right now is I'm not going to show you the project itself because it looks horrible. I'm only halfway through, but um, I'm doing one that uses Node.js as the backend, backbone.js as the framework on the front end, and then that's all this right JavaScript that I'm written, writing for the backbone is in CoffeeScript, using Jade for templating and um, I'm using SAS and I'm slowly transition into styles for all the uh, style sheets. And it all works very nicely together. It all turns into stuff that I can then, it all turns into JavaScript and HTML and style sheets that I can get put, nice, put in a nice package and um, easily given to the user through the open backbone. Um, I would look into, yeah, excuse me, this is, 
really cool. If you want to ever try something like that, I recommend going to GitHub and looking for a backbone uh, boilerplate. They're really nice, and they, they have ones that already um, use CoffeeScript and know that JS. You really want to dive in kind of at first. But otherwise, try Rails and try Django. Uh, Django for Python, Rails for, it's kind of big um, out there. I'll give it a try just so, like, so you're familiar with what it is. So you don't just kind of like know the associated, but you, you, so you have an actual idea and you're not trying to just associate um, what you've heard or rumors um, when people talk about it. And then, or at the very least, give SAS or copy script, script a try, because they are really, really easy. They aren't intimidating at all um, when you get to start using them. SAS especially, because you can just like take what you have, put it into SAS, and it'll turn it right to CSS. So there's like no barrier at all. And yeah, that's about it. Any questions? What does adoption <coughs> for Haml and SAS look like? Um, SAS is getting used quite a bit. I mean, it's the default in, in Rails, I believe, uh, Rails 3.1 did it start even, or just 3 flat. Um, it's, like, you can still write in um, CSS, but, like, it's just, it's almost silly to you because you can just write it in uh, SAS, and then if like suddenly SAS is losing popularity, well, you already have all your CSS style sheets, so you can like convert to whatever. But it's, uh, so yeah. And then uh, Hamel is, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know the numbers, but I'm, Hamel's gotten very popular. I know that there's like several knockoff versions tailored for different situations. For example, Jade was very inspired by Hamel. And are these things like where you run it? I think Zaz was inspired by Hamel as well. But how do you, how, what does the uh, compilation oh. process look like? That's a good point, I should show you that. Let's see if I can go into my server, that'd be nice. If not, um, So here's an example of the blue one right up here. And so here's the nest again. And then here, this is what the nesting looks like. So that's just the add, uh, so that just means parent. So I said parent when it's a tab, uh, when it, uh, something has both a class tab and a class selected, it shows that. And that what it, that ends up looking like is when it compiles it, it's going to be. Uh, But how do you compile it? I mean, what the it will be done. Oh. Like, what I mean, does that look like? Do you run an executable? Do you run a script? I mean, just, is it SAS, I believe? Uh, so I can't remember I put it in the make file and I forget about it. Yeah, the same way. Um, let's try SAS. I think it might be. Oh, oh that's because I was. Oh, that's a bad example. I'm already doing it. And there, 
in. Does it run on Windows? And see, it looks, what? Does it run on Windows? I'm sure that there's a Windows version. Oh, okay. I mean, um, but you can see here, there's the brackets on either side, so it's tab, so it's easier to read. Um, but normally, uh, so what this was was that the uh, HR was in, nested inside the footer when I was originally writing it, and then when it converted it, it says it separated the footer out and then the footer, footer, which is what you need to do when you do that in CSS, and so it just kind of breaks it all out. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, they're very easy. Experience on how it scales. Oh, Node. Um, uh, Node is being used because it's known to scale very well because it's simple to paint code. Um, I personally, I mean, I haven't scaled it for larger projects, but that's it's one of the bigger selling points is that it scales incredibly well. It's pretty lightweight and efficient. Like you can see, I mean, it's kind of their website, so they're going to advertise it there, but it is getting popular with some big companies. Um, okay. Would, uh, do you mix these technologies together in the same uh, like project or yeah. whatever you The project I'm doing, as I said, I'm doing a project right now that uses Node, Backbone, um, CoffeeScript, uh, Jade, and SAS. So I'm turning that into Stylus. And then what have you found like as a kind of a how did you start like actually first using it? Like what was like what did you find and how did you sort of expand from there? Um, well notice the tutorials are well you don't even you just need like the, the very basic most basic documentation to get started. It's not too, <coughs> it's not that difficult and you can use Express framework for it. Uh, I'm, I can show you. But like did you do it with like a specific intention in mind? Or oh, I started doing it because I was going to do um, a JavaScript front end. So I was like, all right, well, I should use Backbone for this. I've heard a lot about it, and I initially tried it with Rails, and I was just like, ah, this seems clunky, and it's not quite what I need. I would like to do it in JavaScript so that I can make it uh, tailored just to certain requirements that I have in mind. And then as I was doing that, I was like, well, what do I want to run it? First, I was like, Apache, and like, okay, and I can just do basic stuff and just basically just surf straight to the one file. But then I thought, well, I'm already building it in the same one one folder. I can just add in a node um, kind of server uh, script in there, and then I just kept expanding it. And then it was nice just writing it all in Java and CoffeeScript. Uh, that's the, my only bit of confusion right now is that I I really should be doing it all in CoffeeScript because it would just be like that's kind of the idea is that of doing it using Node and Backbone is that you're all it's all one language. How like that seems kind of nice, convenient, and probably the right, smarter way of doing it. But I'm try, I was trying to do it a lot in CoffeeScript, because I kind of like it, CoffeeScript. And then, but I was pulling in bits of JavaScript from other projects, and so I need to do the conversion part at some point. But. I guess final question was, because um, I know that it sounds like Facebook, they deliver all of your data in JavaScript delivered chunks, yeah. um, and then I guess they assemble it. Yeah. It sounds like that's probably more expensive than Backbone. Where would you sort of distinguish the two? I think, well, because Facebook, it's like, they have their, they have the, the, they've had the time and manpower to develop their own framework that doesn't quite fit any other, any of the definitions. It's very tailored, but it's like the point of going out and, you know, making the rubber for your wheel and like building a car yourself. It's like, yes, if you spend in the, put in the time and man hours, you'll have a better car than the person who just drives one off a lot. But, like, realistically, how many of us but if you had to like like really want to build your car from the... But if you had to give, like, an oversimplified, like, uh, distinction between the two... 
Oh, what I know. Would you um, would be? I, I would say that it's Facebook is Backbone is kind of one piece. You don't have to just exclusively use Backbone. Like you can use Backbone um, as part of another even Rails, just like the just to make it convenient with the Ajax and storing all the, the models and data on the inside. Um, but it lets you like stuff like local storage, which is becoming a thing, is which lets you store uh, models on the user's browser. It just makes things really wonderfully convenient, rather than having a database of stuff that doesn't that doesn't absolutely need to be protected, but should be stored somewhere for the user's sake. I think there's a great example, which is um, Backbone. Here's the demo. So right here. So this is written in Backbone. Um, and you can use this local storage. So say I go, all right, um, laundry, uh, homework, dishes, um, sleep, whatever. Um, if you look at the, so this is all stored. And when I go, I need to add, it's still there. And it's, still, it's stored using the local storage APIs. And it's not on their the server's database. So, and so that's like it's like so you can use that. So you can use um, backbone for front end convenience for the like users, and then maybe Rails or whatever you like on on one end to um, handle more traditional things. What I think Facebook does is they have their own model system that they have. It's all in there. Like they they definitely written like basically a backbone of their own. It's really very tailored for them, so yeah. it's all through the weird code for this, which defines you can see it's defining a model or collection of you. And that's all the code on that. It's all if you look at the source, this is the initial. And so you see in here it's defining templates. Usually you put that all in one script, but they just put them right up there, and so, So you have a you have a page, then you want to pop up a nice little form, a modal dialog that has a couple of buttons, a couple of fields. You want to make sure that no other events are active at that moment. The user enters something, then you unclick, you do something else, and then you re-enable all the events that were on the previous page. So, I mean, in jQuery, it's one call. In Closure, it's uh, well, that. How much is it in here? On Backbone. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't know. Well, the thing is, Backbone uses jQuery. Or Zapto. Zapto is like a mobile version, which is like jQuery. 
rendering panel with jQuery to strip down to, to be lightweight for mobile. Okay. Perhaps. Um, so you so can you get that right in there. You can be like, um, what you could do is you just so you can on you event you have a you have a view that's defining what your current view is like as the page seems before they pops up the thing and you say event the events there's an events hash where, where you put in events that you're looking for and one of them is the click um, dial uh, hashtag dialog and when they click that they, and you assign it um, make uh, dialog they click that and then what it does is you can just load up the template. Um, call the jQuery, load the, I know what you were talking about, the, the, user, the UI uh, jQuery. Yeah, yeah, dialogue, yeah. Dialogue, yeah. And just say, and then fill it in with this template. Okay, so you, so you so can, like, you're still using that, jQuery right? underneath, I mean. Oh, it, it, yeah, it, it uses jQuery. Yeah, that's a nice. But it, but it keeps, oh, you don't like jQuery? No. Okay. Well, 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 you can use that though instead. <laughs> Oh, what's your GitHub? Um, WC Peterson, I think. WC Peterson. Yeah, there's not much. All, all repos I um, commit to are private, I think. Oh, lame. You would have private GitHub. I'm sorry. I get hired. Yeah. <laughs> they want to keep them private. Well, hmm. I would look at Backbone boil Boilerplate, it's a really nice one. Which it uses, um, so it's people who have extensively studied it and they're like, this is the right way people should be using it. Because Backbone as it is doesn't come up with like a too strict of a framework. It's just like, oh, you can make it how you want. So you can, however you like. And they're like, here's how you probably should. You can tweak it beyond this, but, and they set up with config files and build script. And it's very nice. And they uh, used HTML5 boilerplate in order to use that. So, well, it's just a, yeah, yeah. and they merged two, and then I saw um, another guy who had forked that and uh, added in CopyScript, where he converted it. Plus, there's lots of CopyScript, and so I started my project kind of based on that. And then, of course, right after that, they uh, updated, did a huge merge on the original Backbone boilerplate, <laughs> like months of previous work, rewriting everything, and the guy still hasn't updated his CopyScript um, fork, and I'm like, ah. Yeah. So I've just been kind of messing around and... I think you're shooting yourself in the foot with coffee script. I don't think it's gonna... You're gonna be always catching up to... Everything right, well, but then... That argument's like, well, then JavaScript's gonna go, like, extinct, no. you know? No, no, no. no. JavaScript's not gonna Well, then likewise, like, <laughs> coffee script, it just, like, makes your JavaScript nicer. Yes, that's true. I don't know. It's, much, it's a much nicer language. I agree. I agree. Entirely agree. It's much, much, much nicer. But the problem is, when you're using a library that's been translated, you're always going to be one step back from whatever library you're in. That's true. But so far, I had no problems at all. Okay. That's good to know.